Hi guys, so welcome to the second lesson on network. So what we're going to talk about today is how you can actually learn a little bit about how networks are classified. So our objective of today's lesson is that I want you to be able to actually identify some of the hardware that we use on networks. Now, if this was one of my lessons right now, I might be throwing something around like a sponge ball and getting you to ask some questions, but this is just uh, my PowerPoint slide and you may recognize this from the lesson. So the type of questions that you should already know the answer to is the type of cable that you that is commonly used on the network, such as an unshielded twisted pair, which is made of copper, uh, a local area network. You should be aware that a local area network is used for small areas. You must also be aware that a wide area network, a WAN, is used for large geographical areas. Now, remember, the the problem with wide area networks is that more people can actually get into the system. If you've got a bigger network, there's more people that can do more hacking. So you've got to be aware of security. Um, and there are different types of networks available, such as PAN, SAN, MAN, and VPN. So moving on, So at that point, I've just got you to watch a short little video clip that explains what a peer to peer network is and a client server model. But just to move on, I'm going to explain what a client server is. A client server is the most common way that our networks are managed. So every PC that you see in a classroom is known as your client. That is the PC that is basically making requests, things that it wants. So then we have in the school, or anywhere, maybe an, an office that you work for, you have your server. The server's job is to serve you information or serve you data or serve you access to things such as logging in. So if I type in my login, it's going to request it from the server. Is that count available? Yes, it is. I'm going to give them access to the network. Then it sends it back to your computer and you get whether it was a yes or a no. And it's the common way that we use networks in the, this day and age. Now, the server is usually in charge of controlling things like your, your login, whether you have access to files, any printing that you do, and also your internet access. Now, on some networks, there are many servers available. So there are different servers for everything. You might not just have one server that gives you access to print, to files, to login you might actually have lots of different servers for specific things so you could have a print server that manages the printing an email server a database server so if you're in a school that's running something like sims you will have a database somewhere that has all of that personal information on it and that server is in charge of saying yes you can have that information or no um, communication servers. So maybe you need to actually be, well, we all need to be able to communicate on a network, let's face it. And then there are web servers and the web servers provide you access to your school website or they provide you access to actually making a website more than anything. So it's important to know that you have these servers available, but also your client machine usually has a lower specification. So your PC will usually have a lower specification. And the reason for that is that the server does all the hard work for you. It does all of the legwork. It gets the files. It gets the login. Your actual, the, the actual client just requests the information and gets it sent to it. So peer-to-peer -peer networks. These are networks 
Well, you've got a diagram here with a hub in the middle, but what you actually see more common is that there's not necessarily a hub, but there may be computers going from computer to computer without the hub in the middle. That's the more common diagram that you might see. Now, the function on the peer-to-peer -peer network is that basically there is no one computer in charge. Every computer on your network has equal status. Now, that is a perfect exam answer there. Every computer on a peer-to-peer -peer network has equal status. But you also need to recognize that peer-to-peer -peer networks are generally used for file sharing and they can act every computer can basically act as the server in providing you information or providing you access to their printer and you need to be aware of that so there are some benefits to having a peer-to-peer -peer network which i've highlighted here in green so they're easy to set up and you can use them for sharing files quite easily now we also need to recognize that people don't necessarily use peer-to-peer -peer for sharing legally a lot of people use it to infringe copyright which is why i've put it in red at the bottom some other drawbacks is that it's hard to actually enforce security and the performance can be slow it's hard to do updates because what you generally end up having to do is update each machine individually you can't just push a button and roll it out and they're only really suitable for small homes because the more computers you add to a peer-to-peer -peer network, the, the slower your network generally gets. So at this point, again, in my lesson, I would have given you an activity to, to complete or a worksheet just to kind of assess that you've got to grips with that. Uh, so uh, let's move on. We are now going to look at some of the hardware that can be used to connect a network to the internet. So we're going to start off with our terminal. Now, our terminal could be connected via a hub to other terminals. Okay? Using a hub, data can be sent between three different or more different workstations. By doing it this way, the data is sent, but it's sent to all locations on the network. So workstations 1, 2, and 3 will receive whatever data is being sent between terminals 1 and 2 and 1 and 3. Better than a hub is a switch. Now, switches can be used to connect hubs, they can connect routers, they can connect printers. Basically, switches are a smart hub. And by saying that they're smart, in that unlike the hub, they can send data to a specific location. So this switch could also be connected to a server, and that's how all the other workstations are saving their files to a large server, which can be accessed by the entire network. The switch can also connect another hub that is connecting workstations 4 and 5 together. The other thing that can be connected to a switch is a router. Now, whereas a switch is connecting all data on a network, routers allow for workstations to connect to other devices on other networks via the internet. So we all usually have routers set up at our home to allow us internet access, but they can also be used to connect to other local area networks. Now, they can also be used bridges and gateways. They can be used to connect data to similar networks or different networks. Okay, depending on who you're trying to connect with. But basically, that's just a quick overview on some of the hardware used to connect networks together. So the video that you've just watched will have introduced some of the hardware that I'm about to talk about now. Now, one of the pieces of hardware that you need to be aware of is a network interface controller. Now, it used to be called a network interface card back in the day because it was an expansion card you could put in older machines. But these days, they tend to be just built into most laptops or most PCs onto the motherboard, which is why its name was changed to a controller. Now, all devices are connected together using electronic signals, and these cards go in each PC, and you connect them together using an Ethernet cable, and that is how we send and receive our information. The next piece of hardware you might find on a network is a wireless access point. Now, this is generally connected to the router because the router shares, the router allows you to connect two networks together. Now, on your router, if you want people to be able to access the internet, you can connect the wireless access point to it. Therefore, when your devices connect to the wireless access point, they have a direct connection to the router so they can have access to the internet. 
I would replay that again, but basically wireless access point allows you access to your router. If, it, if the wireless access point is connected to your router, anything that connects to the wireless device can then get onto your internet. A lot of the devices in your home today have your wireless access point and your router combined. But on bigger networks in schools, you need to be able to put wireless access points all around your network. So routers, their, their job are to send data packets between networks so that I can basically go on the internet. Um, in home, they usually allow you to connect to the internet, but the good thing about routers is that they're quite intelligent in making their decision to get the most effective route to get you the information that you need. Hubs aren't used as much as they used to be. Hubs are so hubs and switches are used to connect lots of devices on a LAN. Now hubs aren't used as much today because what tends to happen is if you've got 10 megabyte connection, every computer you add to it takes up some of the bandwidth. So if you have 10 computers and you've got a 10 megabyte bandwidth, each computer is going to end up with one megabyte of bandwidth and it slows down the network because all the data is shared with everybody on the network. Not only is that not very secure, but it means that there's no routing of traffic. So the bandwidth is split when it doesn't really need to. The actual speed of your network slows down. Now this is where switches come in because they're much more intelligent and they actually are self-learning in that they can memorize if you're sending data to the same machine on a regular basis, it will keep that port open so that it can get through to that point. Now they don't share bandwidth because it just goes to the, the connection that it needs to. As soon as it's finished with it, it drops it. Therefore, it's only using the bandwidth that it needs rather than splitting it automatically. They are more expensive though and the more ports you get that you can connect to it, the higher it will cost. So here's an example of a network diagram. So you can see here, uh, here's our internet, but look, you've got a router either side of it connecting those together. Uh, we've also got something on here called firewalls, which are usually built into routers or switches now. And they're not like an eternal wall of fire that you can't get through. They're there to stop hacking and stop people from actually entering your network and causing malicious harm. And you can see how the switch works uh, and that the switch are connected to the phones. Now, what I would generally get you to do at this point, now that you know a little bit more about the network hardware, I would get my students in my lessons to make a network diagram using a website called draw.io. Uh, you can give it a go, but I've covered everything that we need to know at this point for hardware. I hope the video is useful. If you want to look at more videos, please subscribe. I will continue uploading video tutorials for your computer science lessons. Thank you for watching. Now you can try and draw your own using the website draw.io. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Bye.